Um, but uh, how many of you excited about the Word of God? Amen. How, how many of you out there can, how many out there would testify and say that you're your best when you're around the Word of God? I know that's true ab about my life, and so what a privilege and an honor it is uh, to be able to, to open up His Word together. Let's pray as we prepare to jump into the Word of God. Father, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity we have to be joined together in your name. Lord, to lift up your name in praise and worship, to experience your presence, and then Lord, to encounter uh, not only the presence of the Holy Spirit, but the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. He is the, the revelator. He will bring us wisdom. He will bring us insight. He will bring us understanding. Holy Spirit, you're going to teach us and bring us the truth and equip us to become everything that you've called us to be and do everything that you've called us to do. And so we ask that you would take these brief moments that we have together and make the most out of them. Equip us, motivate us, encourage us, strengthen us. Lord, cause us to be everything that you've called us to be as we leave this place, transformed by the power of your word and by the power of your presence, we pray. We receive these things by faith. We thank you for them in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody in agreement said, amen. amen. Well, if you brought your Bible, I want to take you immediately to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 2. As you turn there, let me just say this. Uh, I, I fell in love with 2 Timothy chapter 2 uh, back when I was a teenager, and I've been reading it ever since. And I, I suppose part of the reason for that is just because I felt it to be a very understandable portion of Scripture, a portion of Scripture I could relate with, and a portion of Scripture I felt like I could take and practically apply to my life. And so I just want to say that up here at, at the top because maybe you're here and you're new or maybe you don't, you, you feel like, man, I don't have a whole lot of biblical understanding or experience. Here would be my encouragement to you. Go to the parts that you understand that speak to you, that encourage you, that you can relate with, and you feel like you could do something with it in your life. And keep going back to those places, and keep growing in your understanding, keep allowing God to develop things in your life, and then over time, you're going to grow to understand the Word of God more, right? That's how it works. Of course, we endeavor to have that, you know, relationship with all of God's Word, uh, but listen, let me just help you out. I'm a pastor. I've been doing this for 20 years. Well, not pastoring, but here on staff, and there are still parts of Scripture I read. I'm like, yep, thank you, Jesus. I don't know what you're talking about, but I trust you. It's good for me, and you are speaking to my life, and over time, God brings me the understanding that I need, all right? So we're all in this together. We're all learning. We're all growing, and um, I love 2 Timothy chapter 2 because for me, uh, it's just, it's always been such an impactful portion of Scripture, and so we pick up here 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 2, and Paul makes this statement. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, speaking to a young man by the name of Timothy, says, and the things that you have heard heard from me among many witnesses. Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Timothy, I want you to take the things that I have given to you, and I want you to identify some faithful men, and I want you to give them what I've given you, and, I, and then they in turn are going to take those things, and they're going to give them to others. And so as I, as, as I was uh, considering this a, a couple weeks ago, it just seemed like the Lord was highlighting something to me that I hadn't considered before. Now, if indeed God is speaking to you about a scripture, and you see something that you've never seen before, how many of you know today, it's always been there? So lest we get a big head and think, oh my gosh, I found some breaking revelation. No, God knew it was there the whole time, and he finally got our elevators to go all the way to the top so we could see what we need to see, so we could do what we need to do, all right? And so, and so lest we get a big head, we need to understand how it works, right? But it just seemed to me, anybody been there where you read a portion of Scripture that you've read before and something stood out to you that you hadn't seen or, or maybe that you had forgotten about? It's like, oh, God is speaking to me. And so right here at the top, I want to I wanna pose you with a rhetorical question. I want you to answer the question in your heart, okay? But, but, but Paul is speaking to Timothy about finding faithful men, okay? So if I were to ask you to define the word faithful, how would you define it? How would you describe it? Uh, think, for example, if somebody asked you, you know, just in one or two words, help me to understand what it means to be faithful. What are the one or two words that you would use to describe what it means to be faithful. Well, I've, I've written down a couple here I, th I think we'd all, you know, agree upon. We, we all kind of, you know, would think about when we think about the word faithful uh, to describe it or define it. I, I wrote these words. How, how about this? Consistent. Consistent. A, a faithful person? Well, th that would be a consistent person. How about this one? Reliable. Trustworthy. 
Does anybody feel like trustworthy fits the definition? It would be a good definition of the word faithful, right? On time. <laughs> I like that one. Praise what my, my wife said. I'm more on time than you are. Okay, babe, I know. Diligent. How about this? Loyal. Right? And I'm sure there's a few others out there that you're, you're probably considering, and you're, and, and you're probably thinking about that we could add to our list, okay? And now I agree that all of these definitions are good definitions and help to bring us to an understanding of what it means to be faithful. And like I said, it just seemed to me like the Lord was highlighting something that I hadn't considered before, and it's actually the title of the message tonight. So are you ready? The faithful reproduce. The faithful reproduce. I don't know about you, but over the course of my study and my reading and my thoughts and my consideration, I don't think I've ever known somebody to use the word reproduce as a, as, as a definition or to describe what it means to be faithful. But notice what Paul is telling Timothy here. He's saying, Timothy, listen, I have some things in my possession, and I have given them to you. And now that you have them in your possession and they are a reality in your life, I want you to find faithful men. And I want you to take the things that I've given you and I want you to, to give it to them. And then these faithful men, what they're going to do is they're going to take the things that you received from me and that you gave to them and you're going to give them to others. Uh, don't you see here how there's a reproducing of the things of God from one generation to the next? Are you seeing it there? And so one of the things I, I, I felt like God was, was challenging me on or, or was dealing, me, dealing with me about is the fact that, that, son, that Joseph, if you're going to be faithful, then you need to take the things that I have given to you and that I have produced in your life and that I have done in your life, and you need to take these and you need to pass them on to others. You need to reproduce these realities in the lives of others. Joey, this is what it means to be faithful. Come on, somebody. I, I, think, I think that's good because it helps me understand practically what I need to do. Consistent, well, consistency could apply to anything. God, so, uh, so you're looking for consistency to, from me. You're looking for loyalty, you know, from me. You're looking for me to be on time. You're looking for me to be in my place. Okay, I, I get that, but, but it just seemed like there's a little bit more specificity for me when it comes to my life, that if I want to be a faithful person, I am to take the things that the Lord has given me, the truths, the realities, the experience, the experiences, and I'm to pass them on to others so that their lives can be blessed as well. Can you say amen tonight? So there's a couple things I want to say about our scripture that I think are important in helping us to understand what we're talking about. Notice that Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, I don't want you to find just anybody. And we do our best. That, you know, we, we don't always know who's going to be faithful and who isn't, right? And I think if we, if we did an evaluation of our own lives, we'd have to admit that there's been some times in our lives where we've been faithful and other times where we haven't, all right? In, in the different areas, okay? And so, and so sometimes we can't always tell when an individual is, is going to be faithful. We just do our best to, to pass on the things of God, right? That's what, that's what Paul is saying. But Paul is also saying here, Timothy, if you can identify those faithful people, these are the kinds of people who are going to take the things that you've given them, and they're going to pass them on to others. And so if you, and we're not going to do it tonight, but if you read the following verses, Paul the Apostle begins to describe what faithful men and women look like. It's trying to help Timothy to identify what a faithful person looks like. And he begins to talk about, listen to this, soldiers. He says, Timothy, I want you to consider a soldier for just a moment, because soldiers have attributes, Soldiers have qualities. Soldiers have practices. They have things that they have incorporated into their, into their practice and into their lives that you can learn from in order for you to be faithful as well as, for, as to help you identify those that are faithful. He says, he says, notice this about soldiers, Timothy, that they are people who know how to endure hardship. If you want to know what a faithful person looks like, it's a person who knows how to bear up underneath the pressures and the scrutiny of life, who know how to deal with the, you know, with the opposition and the attacks of the enemy, and they know how to keep on keeping on. They know how to endure. They know how to persevere, persevere and they don't change when the pressure hits their life. Timothy, there's something you can learn about a soldier as it relates to being faithful in your life. 
Not only this, but he says, if you notice this also about soldiers, Timothy, that there are people who keep themselves untangled from the affairs of life. They don't find themselves so caught up in this and so caught up in that and so, you know, influenced by this and swayed by that that they are not able to please their commanding officer. Ooh, I think this is a word for the church today in this generation. God is looking for a people who are not so, in, so entangled with life that they're unable to fulfill the directives of their commanding officer. My friends today, his name is Jesus, and the Bible describes him as the very captain of our salvation. I don't know about you, but I'm trying to let him lead my life. And I cannot afford to become so entangled with the affairs of this life that I don't follow the one who is trying to lead me. He says, not only this, Timothy, not only will you find soldiers to be uh, examples of what it is to be faithful, but you're going to find athletes as examples of what it means to be faithful. These are people who compete according to the rules. Ooh, that's another good one. They don't cheat the system. They aren't cutting corners. They know what it takes to finish well, and they have made all the necessary preparations in order to win their race. This is what it means to be faithful. And if you can find men and women with these kinds of qualities, you've identified a faithful person. And then finally, he brings up farmers. And he says, hey, hey, hey look at the, maybe the, the most outstanding attribute of a farmer. Man, they've got to be a hardworking person to plow that ground and to sow the seed and then to be patient over the season and wait for the, anybody out there feel tired already, right, right? And, and then to go and, and not only do they get the crop, but they gotta go harvest the crop and then they gotta take the crop, they gotta prepare their meal and then they gotta take the leftover crop and they got to sell it to make some money so they can get some more seed and they start the whole process all over again. But this is what it means, this is what it means to be faithful. And so, Timothy, I want, you, I, I want you to identify people like this because it's people like this, people with such character, that are the most qualified and impactful people when it comes to passing on the truths and the realities of God to others. Let me say that again because I don't think you got it today. It's faithful people who are the most powerful the most impactful and the most qualified to take the things of God and to pass them on to others. When it comes to teaching, preaching, or sharing, a teacher must be a person of reputable character. People who don't just teach and preach, but people who live out the things that they say. How many of you know today that sound teaching coupled with a sound life is what makes for a dynamic duo that impacts the lives of those around us? It's the power of example. There's a lot of people, I, I mean, you want to find somebody who's eloquent, just go watch politics. They don't got a whole lot of character. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but they don't inspire me to follow their example, right? Why? Because they say one thing in front of the camera, and then they doing something else in private. And my friends, the thing that's going to make our, uh, you know, our ability to take the things of God and pass them on to others, uh, to make that influential and effective. How many of you out there want to be effective? I want to be effective. It's going to be the people who practice what they preach. And when you can couple those two things together, all of a sudden you have a dynamic duo that impacts and transforms the lives of the people around us, right? It's the gap between what we say and what we do that undermines the things that we say. Isn't it true? You've got friends and family who don't come to church because church is a bunch of people that are a bunch of... How did you know what I was going to say? Now, lest we criticize the church too much, at least we have standards that we are trying to live up to. Can you say amen? amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, but when we can couple a sound life with sound teaching, we're able to adequately and effectively pass on the things of God to the people around us. All right? Character, uh, I'm sorry, example, the, the, the power of example is so powerful. I think if you and I were honest, we'd have to acknowledge that many of the virtues that are a present reality in our lives today are the result of somebody who exemplified 
those virtues and those realities for us. Isn't it true? Wouldn't it also be true that many of the idiosyncrasies and the dysfunction and the, you know, it, 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 that, we, that we have in our lives, it's because of the example, the poor example that we were left, whether it was growing up or when we were in college or, or when we were in the military or, we're, you know, we were on the, on the soccer team or whatever, or, or whatever it is, right? It was Uncle Ray Ray who kind of set a bad example, and that's why I do and think the way that I do and think. But, but, but come on, and so I, I think what I'm trying to say to you is you and I need to understand just how powerful example really is there's a power in example and when we couple you know and so what is Paul telling Timothy he's saying Timothy I want you to find faithful men faithful men people who have these qualities people who practice what they preach because they are going to be most effective and most qualified in passing on the things of God are you hearing me today let me read the verse again, just so you, you, you keep up, right? It's, it says, And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now, I realize already, I already said it, okay, but let me say it again. Not only was Paul telling Timothy to find faithful men, but notice what faithful men do. They take the things that have been given to them and they pass it off to others. Faithful men and women reproduce. This is, this is their behavior. This is, this is a practice in their life. This is something that they do, you know, time and time again. They take the things that were committed to them and they teach others also. Notice again, you've got Paul the Apostle taking the things that he was delivered that were delivered to him by the Lord, and he gave them to Timothy, and then he charged Timothy to take what he gave Timothy and give it to faithful men and women who were then in turn responsible for taking those things and passing it on to others. I, I see four generations of people in this, right? Do, do, do you see that there? Hey, Timothy, I've given you some things. There's Paul giving to Timothy, who is giving to faithful men, who is passing those things off to others. That's four generations of people. And what's so cool is that this faithfulness to re reproduce in others is what was done over the years, and it has been so effective that today in San Bernardino, nearly 2,000 years later, we are celebrating the fact that we have come to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We have been saved. We have been delivered. We have experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. We have been delivered from the power of darkness, and we have been translated over into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Come on, we have become a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a chosen generation, God's own peculiar people, pro proclaiming the praises of Him who has called us out of darkness and into His marvelous light. Today, I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus and I have been begotten again to a living hope and I'll tell you my future is brighter than ever because I know Jesus and he knows me now how is that a reality because faithful men and women throughout the millennia took the things that were delivered to them and they passed them on to others and on and on this took place over the generations so that today the word of God has been delivered to you and to me Come on, they were faithful, and they delivered the word of God one generation to the next. Some of them lost their lives over it, y'all. And we sit here in our comfort and in our convenience here in the United States of America. Sometimes we don't even know how to bring our Bible or give God enough attention. But I'm here to tell you today that there was faithful men and women that went before us, that paid for the gospel to be here on our laps with their very lives. They passed on the word of God. They passed on the presence of God. They passed on the Holy Spirit. They passed on what it means to be holy. They passed on the truth. They passed on the magnificent and faithful works of God. They passed on one generation to the next, praising God's faithfulness. They taught us what it was to worship him in spirit and in truth. They passed on personal self 
self-sacrifice. They've passed on love. They have passed on generosity. They have taught us what it means to work in koinonia fellowship with one another. They have faithfully declared that Jesus is Lord. They, they, they showed us what it means to serve one another. They sent people in the world to make the name of Jesus famous among those who are lost. Generation after generation, faithful men and, and women passed these things on, modeled and taught what it was that, they, that, that had been delivered to them. And today, the responsibility falls to you and to me to faithfully pass on the things that we have learned and that God has done in our hearts and our lives to the people around us in the spheres of influence that God has given to us. The responsibility falls to you and to me, upon whom the ends of the world have come. Listen, tonight, I don't want to be an alarmist. I don't want to get dramatic. I don't like drama. Come on, somebody. I don't like to catastrophize, for those of you educated people. I like to keep it real. But if I could keep it real tonight, the stakes could not be higher. The stakes could not be higher. We are one generation away from losing all that God has done. You say, how could, this, how could this young man make such a bold statement, one generation away from losing? Let me say it again. Let, let, me, say, let, let me say it a little bit more direct. We are one generation away from extinction. How, how, could, you make, how could you make such a statement? I'm reminded of a story. I'm, I'm going to pop the verse up on, on the screen, but, but it's found in Judges chapter 2. And if you remember the story of, of Israel, uh, Israel was, was uh, uh, they were in slavery 400 years, and God took this man by the name of Moses, and, and Moses, with God's help, delivered this people out of 400 years of slavery. And so, long story short, they trek across the desert for 40 years, and uh, Moses comes to the end of his life. He started his ministry at 80, so for those of you a little discouraged of your progress in life, that's not to worry. God can take you at whatever age you are and do great and mighty things. Hallelujah. And the Bible says, and so this was like a 40-year process, right? So he's coming to like 120 by the time he's going home to be with the Lord. The Bible says, man, his eye wasn't dim and his strength hadn't left him. Come on, that's a good promise to claim. I don't know about you, right? But Moses comes to the end of his life and he passes off the leadership to this man by the name of Joshua. Moses, Moses was faithful to deliver the children of Israel, lead them through the wilderness. They conquered, had many, you know, many victories of battle. And here Joshua comes and Joshua takes over. Well, Joshua is the one to lead them into the promised land. And don't you know that where they had failed before, Joshua, with the power of God, was able to help them to conquer that land, to evict you know, their enemies and take possession of what it was that God had for them. Okay, everybody follow me? It's called the promised land. All right, so you got Moses, delivered the people, took them through the wilderness, passing off his leadership to Joshua. Joshua goes in and evicts the enemies of the promised land, and they take possession of the promised land. But then here in Judges chapter 2, beginning with verse number 7, we find Joshua coming to the end of his life. Joshua is coming to the end of his life, and notice what the scripture says. It says, so the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old, and they buried him within the border of his inheritance at timnath Herez in the mountain of Ephraim on the north side of Mount Gash. Notice these next words. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. And if you know anything about the rest of the book of Judges, it was an extremely dark time for the nation of Israel. They got lost and mixed up with all kinds of things all the time. God had to raise up a judge, deliver them, I, I kid you not. I kid, you you want to know what, 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 what the book of Judges talks about? It says that the nation of Israel, they disobeyed God. They walked away from God. They knew, didn't know who God was. They got enslaved by their enemies, right, for like 20 years. They cry out to God. God raises up a, a, a deliverer, delivers them, and they serve God for about another four years, and then they go right back to the same thing. Although it's just one ugly cycle of having lost sight of the things of God. Uh, can, I can I propose a thought to you this, to, this evening? 
perhaps Joshua and that generation was real good at taking the land, but Joshua and that generation was not so good at passing on the things that they had learned to the next generation, so that when the next generation took power, they knew how to do and to serve the Lord, do the things of God and to serve the Lord. Are, are you hearing me today? And, and, and that's why I'm bold enough to make this statement. Hey, here's the reality. We are one generation from going extinct. Are you going to leave the next generation to figure it out on their own? Am I going to leave the next generation to figure it out on their own? Am I going to leave it up to God to, you know, God, you're going to have to do some supernatural work in order to get this thing started all over again? Come on, because we know that God is, is resilient. doesn't matter what we do. His plan is going to succeed. But here's the reality. We have a responsibility to the people around us to take the things of God and to pass them on faithfully to others. I'm preaching better than y'all are saying, hey, you're a little bit of a tough crowd tonight, but that's all right. I'm going to do my job anyways. <laughs> Amen. Okay. Okay, so what about your family? If, if, if nobody else, what about your family? What about your friends? What about your loved ones? Okay, okay, but God is not one generation away from going extinct. Okay, but what about the people that God has entrusted to you in your sphere of influence? If you don't say something, perhaps nobody will. If you don't teach something, if you don't pass something along, perhaps nobody will. Tonight, we need to understand just how high the stakes are, and we need to become those faithful men and women who reproduce. Amen. So it's our responsibility not just to endeavor to live life well, but also to develop the things in others so that they are not lost, the things of God in others, all right? So today I got three points we're going to go through very quickly, all right? Faithful men and women produce, right? The faithful produce, okay, watch this, number one, God's heart in others. Number one tonight, if you're asking, all right, what am I supposed to reproduce? Am I just supposed to reproduce babies? I know some of you are all thinking it. You know that God told, told people at the very beginning, I want you to be fruitful and multiply. So that's part of it. Yes? Do, do we need to go there so I could show you? <laughs> Pastor Dan said, go there. <laughs> God told Adam and Eve, I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. I want you to take dominion over the earth. Amen? But how many of you know today that God expects more than us just producing babies? He, expe he expects us to reproduce spiritual things. You know, uh, Working things, emotional things, fiscal things. I mean, the, the whole, the, as it relates to the whole of a human life, God wants us to reproduce after our kind, right? And, and, we, are, and we are people, we are men and women of God. If, you, if, if you've given your heart and life to Jesus, right? And God wants you to reproduce the things that he has done in your heart and life in the lives of others, and so, and so we're getting specific tonight, things that we can reproduce in the lives of others. Okay, number one is that the faithful reproduce God's heart in others. I got to go now because we're out of time. Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 19. Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 19. Look at what Paul endeavored to do in the lives of the Galatians. He says, my little children for whom I labor in birth again, notice these words, until Christ is formed in you. Paul knew what it was like to labor, not physically, but spiritually, in order that he could reproduce, listen to his words, Christ in the lives of the church there at Galatia. And of course, as it's true for the, for the lives of the church there at Galatia, it was true for all the churches, and it is true for us today. One of the things that God is trying to do in your life is to form Christ in you. The book of Romans tells us that whom he predestined, these he also called to be conformed to the image of his son. Oh, one of the things that God's trying to do in your life is to make you more like Jesus. Walk around here talking about, I'm from San Bernardino. That's fine. As long as Christ is being formed in you, and each and every day you're becoming more and more like him, and less and less like the San Bernardino that we all know is with us, right? Right? 
Is, it, is this okay, everybody? Or, or do I need to put on really nice and pretty words so I'm not offensive to, to, to you? I'm trying to help you all tonight. And God is about the business of making you more like Jesus. But notice what it says here. Paul joined God in God's mission to work this reality into the life of the people. And if Paul could join God in God's mission to make those Galatians more like Christ, how many of you realize today we can join God in his mission to make other people like Jesus, and we can cooperate and become those vessels? All right, somebody's getting it. Galatians 4.19, can you guys put it up there again? This word formed. Ooh, look, they even got it highlighted. Making it easy tonight. Five minutes left here, right? All right. The word formed in the Greek is the word morpho. Look at your neighbor and say morpho. Look at your other neighbor and say what he said. Or what she said, depending. Okay. It is the Greek word morpho. Now there is another there's another word in the Greek used to describe do you understand that the new testament was was written in greek and we've translated it to english can you all follow with me okay and so we're taking a look at the original greek word somebody said i like that more father they got it <laughs> they've been saying that all night long <laughs> okay we're taking a look at the greek word to help us gain a greater understanding of what it is that god is trying to communicate to us so this word formed, originally in the Greek, is the word mor morpho, okay? But there is another Greek word used to describe forming something, and that's the word schema. Now just follow me. These two words are in stark contrast to one another. Schema signifies an external formation, or it's, it's talking to the outer appearance Morpho refers to the internal reality. Galatians 4.19 is speaking of a change in character, becoming conformed to the character of Christ in actuality, not merely in appearance. What was our point? That faithful men and women pass on or reproduce the heart of God in others, okay? God is trying to produce his character, his nature, his attributes, his love, his outlook, and his heart in the lives of people. And as I, as I mentioned a moment ago, you and I can join God in his mission and become those faithful laborers who help develop that. And you know how we do it? We look at what God has done in our lives in order to produce the character of Christ in us. And we take those truths and those realities and those experiences and we share them with others and those become tools by which they're able to see God's, you know, God's work take place in their life and they become more like Christ. Is that simple enough? Is that understandable enough tonight? The faithful reproduce God's heart in others. Number two, the faithful reproduce a good understanding in others. I don't know about you, but I'm, <laughs> we need some more level-headed people in our world. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm preaching to myself right now. Because I got some family members and some friends. And uh, sometimes I wonder, somebody said, what is he looking for? Nothing. I'm just trying to look away. The faithful reproduce a good understanding in others. I love this Colossians chapter 3, verse number 16. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 16. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you, dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Notice these next words. Teaching and admonishing one another. You thought preaching and teaching was just for the pastor in the pulpit. No, 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 no. God has called you to preach and to teach in your spheres of influence. You may not be called to a pulpit or to a stage, but God has called you to be those faithful full-time ministers of the gospel and to preach and to teach and to reproduce a good understanding in the world around you. Let's read on. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, 
Notice what he says, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Anybody, anybody out there ever been sharing something with somebody and you just kind of felt the Holy Spirit? Oh, this, what I'm telling you reminds me of a song. And it goes like that. Anybody out there seen Sound of Music? If you haven't, man, you're missing out. <laughs> I'm, 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 I might be aging myself at this point. I don't know. Remember, uh, I don't even remember her name at the, at the moment. Remember the main character? She goes to see the nun and she's like, you know, all confused about life and she just breaks into song. Right? Okay, now whether you feel like you're a singer or not, that's not the point. The point is, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. But I'm not a pastor. That's not written to pastors. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly and take that word in wisdom and teach one another. If God gives you a song and you're not a singer, go tell him to listen to it. <laughs> right? But I, I, I'm sorry for getting off track. You understand my point. We're trying to bring and reproduce a good understanding in others. Listen, Dave, if you haven't noticed, we are living in a time where deception is ramping up. It is all over the place. And it is the day and the hour for faithful men and women to faithfully pass off the truth of God's word and the truth. Come on, Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And there are people who are bound in their life because they are bound by lies and deception. And they need somebody a little wiser, perhaps even a little older or even younger, right? <laughs> but just somebody who has a little bit more truth than they do, who is willing to take that truth and to pass it off to them so that lies and deception can be undone, so they can experience the freedom as well as the stability that God has for their life, so they're not wrapped up and lost in the nonsense of the world. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 13 and 14 Therefore take up the whole armor of God That you may be able to withstand in the evil day And having done all to stand Notice what he says next Stand therefore How? How do I stand? Having, your, having girded your waist with truth We got too many people walking around and doing life Without the truth they need to be successful And what they need is faithful men and women to go and reproduce a good understanding in them so that when the lies and the deception of the world and the lies and the deception of the enemy come at them, they're able to cut them things down with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and truth becomes to them a shield and a buckler. Come on, some... I I didn't plan on saying this, but I took my son to the... Well, I didn't take... My wife took my son. I was working. Took my son to the doctor, uh, and when you go into junior high, they make you get a physical. I'm just going to be transparent about it today, because you need to understand. All right, now th th you, this is one arena of life, but I, I, I want you to hear what I'm saying to you. We took him to the doctor to have a physical, uh, because the, the school requires it to go into junior high. And so at one point during the uh, appointment, the doctor asked my wife to leave the room. Well... I've grown up trusting doctors, trusting, you know, those who have pledged their lives for the betterment of humanity. So my wife left the room. Well, the doctor did what, what she did, and the appointment was over. And so when it was over, my wife asked my son, what, what happened? What, what, you know, what did the doctor do? My son said, well, the doctor asked me if I felt like a boy or a girl. Then the doctor asked ask me if I liked boys or girls. And then the doctor, now he's 12 years old, and the doctor asked me if I've ever had sex before. What? All in the absence, listen to me very carefully, all in the absence, having dismissed the parent. Can, can I help you all out tonight? Now that we know, don't leave the room. <laughs> you, you stay there with your children. But that's not the point. The point is, I have to equip my, my children with the truth so that when they're being presented with lies and deception, even from people that we ought to be able to trust. Now listen, I have a lot of respect for those of you who have given your lives in the medical field, so I'm not trying to criticize doctors and, and nurses. I'm trying to say to you that there are lies and deception present in our world all over the place, and they're going to eat up 
people's lives if we don't pass along the truth so that people can understand how to navigate life. <laughs> Finally today, the faithful reproduce the presence of God in others. Of course, God manifests his presence. We don't control that with a switch. That's not what I'm saying. But how many of you know today that we are carriers of God's presence? And, uh, boy, we ought to be able to teach people how to approach God and how to pray and how to worship, right? Wasn't it, wasn't it the book of Hebrews says, come boldly before the throne of grace. Hey, enter in by a new and living way, by the blood of Jesus into the holy place because you are, and all of a sudden, as, you know, I've, been, I've been there when people have done it for me. They've prayed for me, and all of a sudden, the presence of God where I couldn't seem to find it in my own life. They prayed for me, or they spoke to me, or they ministered to me, and a door was opened so that the presence of God came into my life. And the same is true for all of us. Because we are vessels and carriers of God's presence, we can go ahead and be used of God to bring God's presence into the lives of others. I got one more story as we close today. Uh, uh, we, we've been getting ready for Christmas, and so I've been listening to all these Christmas songs. And you want to know why us pastors are done with Christmas? The, the moment... 1201 December 26th we're done because we've been listening to Christmas for six months long oh little town of Bethlehem oh little I better, better leave it alone right so I'm in the car with my kids and we're on, on the way to the store and I'm listening to these Christmas songs and there's some powerful powerful words in these Christmas songs and we're listening to one of my favorite oh holy night and so I just uh, listen they're children 10 and 12 years old what am I going to do shut up and listen to the listen to the song be more spiritual no 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 that's not how you do it okay I said hey guys listen to this beautiful music so they kind of calmed down for a second kind of went back right back to it hey guys hey, hey guys it's not just beautiful. listen to the words and so we we went to the store and and we're listening to Christmas week on the way back and so we get home pull into the garage and uh, the song gets to the to the to the big part where fall on your knees oh hear the angels and it's the, it's the climax of the song and the singers are singing out in all of their you know vocal ability and they're harmonizing well my son got out of the car and he kind of went and did his thing but me and my daughter stayed in the car and I was just worshiping God right but she stayed in the car well the song ends we go ahead and get out of the car and I turn and look and here she comes with tears coming down her face. And I said, baby, why are you crying? I don't know. I said, are you okay? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. It's just Jesus. Yeah. And so we embraced and we cried together. Listen, guys. If not me, who's going to minister to my children and bring the presence of God into their lives? Right? Well, I'm going to leave them up to figure it out themselves? No, 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 no. Today, we need to become faithful men and women. We need to take the things that God has done in our lives. We need to pass them off to others so that they can be blessed and we can see the things of God continue. Can you say amen tonight? Amen. The faithful reproduce. What does it mean to be faithful? It means to reproduce. And there's opportunities all around us all the time. Tonight, before I dismiss, I just want to make sure that everybody here is right with Jesus. Listen, I don't know where you're at, um, but here I go again. The stakes couldn't be higher. Your eternal life is at stake tonight. And I want to love you enough to tell you the truth. God has presented us with the most amazing opportunity for us to be redeemed and forgiven of our sin so that we can enter into a relationship with him and that at the end of our life whether sooner or later we can step into heaven and avoid our presence in a place called hell that's the reality there's no greater stakes for a human life than where you will spend eternity and I want to love you enough to tell you the truth you need to get right with Jesus today if you've not given him all of your heart and if you've not given him all of your life Listen, God doesn't want you in hell. In fact, the Bible says God didn't create hell for people. God created hell for the devil. But if you're gonna live like the devil, you're gonna get his reward. 
What do you mean live like the devil, Pastor Joe? You know, the devil was lifted, he, the devil was part of heaven. He was lifted up in pride, decided that he wanted to be, listen to these words, a God to himself. And isn't that the temptation today? For us to live unto ourselves, godless. Today, if you are God, now, here's the reality. Because the devil thinks that we're so stupid that if we abandon God or we don't say yes to Jesus, that we're going to be free. Here's the reality. You're going to serve something. If it's not Jesus, you're going to serve something. I know people serving lust, serving drugs, serving relationships, serving, trying to get rich, trying to get wealthy, trying to get famous. People were made to worship. You're going to serve something. And I'm here to tell you today that anything else other than Jesus Christ is going to lead you to a dead end. And I use that word intentionally, a dead end. It's going to lead you to death and to that eternal grave, which you and I would, would do well to fear. So where are you at with God today? Are you doing life your own way? And if you are, are you willing to surrender all of your heart and all of your life to Jesus Christ? Okay, because if you haven't, I want to love you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Jesus said this, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. In other words, this is my heaven. You've got to get there my way. Again, there's, there's lies and deception out there that all of us are going to make it doing things our own way. Well, we're all on our way to heaven. One person this way and another person that way. You won't find that anywhere in the scripture. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So this is God's heaven. You got to get there God's way. I've already said it, but this is God's way that you surrender all of your heart and all of your life to Jesus. That's it. You surrender all your heart, all of your life to Jesus. Why? So that he can forgive you and wash you clean of your sin. Here's the reality. We're all sinners. We're going to have to stand before a holy God whom the Bible describes as the judge of all flesh. And the, only, the only answer for the sin in our lives, okay, that's going to suffice is the answer that you gave Jesus all of your heart and all of your life. That's the only thing. Jesus' innocent life where his body was broken and his blood was shed for your sin. That's the only thing that's going to redeem your life from the sin that, that you and I were born with and that we've committed all of, our, all of our lives. That's the only thing. Okay, let me tell you what it's, what's not going to make it. All right? You trying to be a good person. Now, where in the Bible do you, do you find that because you're a good person, you're going to make it to heaven? It's not there. Now, where will you find because your good works out, outweigh your bad works or because you're better than your neighbor? or you haven't done things as bad as somebody else, that somehow you're gonna make it. You cannot be good enough to make it to heaven. The Bible says we've all sinned, we've all fallen short of, the, of, of, of God's righteousness. There's, no, there's not a single righteous person. No, not one. Listen, you can't make it, you can't make it on your good works today. You can't make it because you're thinking you're gonna make it because you're hoping that you're gonna make it. You can't think or hope your way into heaven, okay? You cannot be religious enough tonight to make it. You can come to church every last day of your life, die and go to hell, and somebody needs to love you enough to tell you the truth. You need to surrender your heart. You need to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And today, God has done everything that he can to make you right with him. But one thing he won't do is violate your free will. It's your call, and it's your choice. God doesn't want robots. God wants people who have their own free will say yes to Jesus. And when you say yes to Jesus, God, I'm giving you all my heart, all my life. The Bible says in that moment, Jesus comes down on the inside. He washes you up, makes you brand new. You're on your way to heaven, denying your presence in hell. So tonight, the ball's in your court. How are you going to respond? If you need to give God all your heart, all your life, I'm going to count to three. Hit my hand on this microphone when I do. If that's you, ready to give Jesus all your heart and all your life, you slip your hand up in the air. I'll see it, and you can put it right back down. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is simply this. Pastor Joe, that's me. I need to give Jesus today all my heart. I need to give Jesus today all my life. I'll see your hand, and you can put it right back down. Are you ready? Here we go. On the count of three, if that's you, be bold tonight. Stakes couldn't be higher for your life. Ready? One, 
two, three. Come on, slip your hand up in the air. I got one, two, three, four. Thank you, God bless you. Five, I see that hand. Thank you, God bless you. Six, I see that hand. Six wise people in the building. I didn't embarrass them, not gonna embarrass you. Six wise, seven, eight. Thank you, God bless you. Eight wise people going for Jesus. Nine, thank you, God bless you. Anybody else? Pastor Joe, that's me. I need to give Jesus all my heart. I see that hand. 10, 11. Thank you, God bless you. Anybody else? Pastor Joe, that's me. I want to give 12. Thank you, God bless you. 12 wise people going for Jesus today. Going to give God all their heart, all their life. Going to leave the past behind. Going to repent of their sin. And we've got about 12 wise people. Anybody else? Let me look over you guys one more time. Anybody else? If you're sitting in your seat, I got those hands. Thank you. If you're sitting in your seat wondering if you should and you haven't gotten your hand up yet, it's not too late. It's your opportunity. You don't know how many opportunities you're going to get before it's too late, so come on. Anybody else? All right, well, praise God for the 12 wise people in the building this evening. All right, this is what we're going to do. Those of you who who got your hand up, I'm gonna ask everybody to stand to their feet tonight. I want those of you who got your hand up to slip out of, the, out of your seat, walk these aisles, meet me right down here in front. We're gonna lead you in a prayer to give God all of your heart and all of your life. And so we need you to come now. Come on, you come now. it's not too late if you need to come you say but I didn't get my hand up that's all right you come anyway all right well here's the deal we're gonna lead you in a prayer to give God all of your heart and all of your life why because the Bible says if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you'll confess him as Lord with your mouth it says you shall be saved it's a done deal like we said tonight, you move out of the old life into a new one. Out of, the, out of the power and control of the enemy, the devil, into the kingdom of God, right? Just from your heart, saying yes to Jesus with your mouth. And watch and listen to this. The past is wiped away. You have a clean slate and a brand new future headed for heaven tonight and hell. Come on, bow your heads with me. Close your eyes, and I want you to say this prayer from your heart to the Lord with your mouth, okay? Now do me a favor and say it loud enough for your own ears to hear. We're all gonna say it together, all right, so you're not gonna be embarrassed. But come on, from your heart, say these words. Say, Heavenly Father, I come before you tonight and I thank you for your great love for me that you would send Jesus, your only begotten son, to die on a cross to pay for my sins. Tonight, I believe that he came, that he died, but that he rose again. And today, Lord Jesus, I give you all my heart and I give you all my life. Forgive me of my past. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean and make me new. In fact, fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name. I thank you now. I am yours and you're mine. I'm headed for heaven and I'll never be in hell. In Jesus' name, amen. And congratulations. <laughs> Listen, we, we believe that if you prayed that prayer, you're born again, okay? You said you're gonna give God all your heart, all of your life you did just that, all right, God takes you at your word. Now listen, you need to keep on coming back to church. 
Don't think for a moment that you can go out there and make it on your own. Somebody needs to love you. Somebody needs to help you. All right? You're going to encounter the challenges and struggles. In fact, okay, let now, here we go. All right? The Bible says that trouble will arise for the sake of the word. In other words, man, Pastor Joe, I was doing just fine until I came in last Sunday night and said yes to Jesus. Now all hell broke loose in my life. Why? Because the devil wants you back. Now here's the deal. There isn't a single soul on planet earth that God hasn't been able to cause them to live victoriously. You can live victoriously, and we want to help, all right? So you get back to church. I want you to make a left hand turn my right. Follow this is Pastor Joel right back over there. He's going to give you some free literature, and he's going to let you go, all right? God bless you guys. Welcome to the family of God. I look forward to seeing you. God bless 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 you. Come on, isn't it good to be in God's house and see people give their lives to Jesus? Praise the Lord. All right, all right. Well, come on, raise your hands to the Lord. Let me pronounce a blessing over you, and then you can be dismissed. Father, I thank you for each one of these, your precious people. God, I ask that you would bless them. Lord, teach us and show us, Lord, the opportunities and the influence uh, all around us to be able to take the things that you have taught us and the things that you have done in our lives and to faithfully give them over to others. And Lord, we know that we will be blessed, they will be blessed, and Lord, we're gonna be double blessed because we're gonna rejoice to see it happen in their lives. So we thank you, Lord. Bless your people in the city, bless them in the field, bless them coming, bless them going, let everything they put their hand to prosper. And Lord, today as we leave, we wanna say out loud, on purpose, and in faith that the Inland Empire shall be saved. God bless you. What a blessing. Hey, thank you so much for joining us online. If you just gave your heart to Jesus and prayed that salvation prayer with our pastor, congratulations and welcome to the family of God. Here at The Rock, we want to get you plugged in and set up for success as you start this new walk with God. In a moment, I'd like for you to head over to our Respond to God page by clicking the link provided in the comments where you can fill out your information so we can provide you with some free materials. We have a booklet called Welcome to Your Destiny, Easy Steps to a Successful Future with God. We'd love to mail you this paper copy if you are within the continental United States. If not, don't worry about it. We have an electronic copy in PDF format that we would be happy to email you. We also have a comic book we'd love to send out for any kids that have made a decision to follow Jesus. It helps explain their new walk with Jesus in a fun and age-friendly way. We not only want to provide you with these free materials, but if you live locally, we would also like to get you connected with a friend. A spiritual personal trainer, or as we like to call them, SPTs, who can help guide you through your new relationship with God. We encourage you to connect with the local church in your area. And if you are in the Inland Empire, remember you're always welcome here at The Rock Church. Well, it was great hearing the Word of God with you guys today. We can't wait to see you at our next service. And remember, God loves you and so do we.